All right, everybody. Um, I think my audio is coming through, uh, so we'll go ahead and get started. If for some reason my audio cuts out, just let me know in chat. Um, I don't have much in the way of announcements. Um, just keep on trucking with our homework schedule. Uh, since most of you all are in steel design, we are going to have a homework assignment, or in, in concrete design, sorry. Uh, we are going to have a homework in steel design, but it is incredibly short. Um, uh, it is incredibly short. The uh, it, it, you could do it on like two lines of notebook paper short. I mean, it is it is short. Uh, and I did that just because everybody's got uh, uh, the homework assignment. I'm also playing my slideshow instead of just showing the slides. I recently learned a little tech tip that if you hit Control L or Control L uh, during a slideshow, you all should be able to see a laser pointer. So that that helps during the uh, during the slides. I, I believe everybody can see the laser pointer. So uh, so yeah. Okay, um, let's just get right into it. Um, we are done with columns, and we are now going to talk about our final topic in the semester, which is going to take us the rest of the semester, and that's beams. Um, beams are going to take a little while because they um, there's a lot going on with them, and so you really need to take it one step at a time. And the way I've formatted the lecture notes are intended to do just that. Um, we're going to start off with basic flexural theory uh, and then we're going to get into a, um, a a new property associated with beams and that's really our main focus today and it's this property zx um, or z just in general uh, i'm just curious uh if, if everybody has their manual if you open your manual to, to table one one you know the table with all the properties for the w shapes like if you were trying to look up the flange width of a W10 by 49. I, I don't know. It doesn't really matter. If you look over on the right page, um, you should see a, a series of properties for the x-axis and the y-axis. We've already looked at some of these before because at the very least we've looked up R values for columns like the radius of gyration for the x-axis and the y-axis. But if you look, there are four properties listed associated with the x-axis and the y-axis. An I value, an S value, an R value, and a Z value, okay? Uh, if everybody should be able to see that. After today, I think you'll understand what all of those are. Um, we, we've only used really R values up until this point, but, but that S value and that Z value, I want that to make uh, pretty clear sense uh, after today. Um, so let's get into it. Um, Let's start off with a basic, basic, basic review of, uh, of Engineering 216. So this is Mechanics of Deformable Bodies. Um, I know it's been a while for a lot of you uh, since you've had this class. Um, but by now, I know it's been a while, but we've used this formula even in concrete design, because I know everybody in here has, has had concrete design. Many of you are in it now. Um, and at the very least, you should have a familiarity with the formula in gray. Sigma equals my over i. Okay, so let's take a step back and let's make sure that we're all clear as to what that formula is. That formula will tell you the bending stress in a beam, right? So uh, you take a beam, you bend it. Um, what is the, bend, the stress as a result of that applied bending? And so you need three quantities in order to do that. All right. You need the bending moment M, which the bending moment, that just comes from the moment diagram. That just comes from this. So if you have your moment diagram, you know, if I'm looking at this beam, maybe the maximum bending moment is right there. And so if it's a simply supported beam and a uniformly distributed load, we've been using WL squared over eight. Uh, so in concrete design, that should be a, an old hat formula by now. Of course, if it's not, if it has a point load or it has something else, I mean, you, you, you wouldn't use this formula. But by and large, you all should know how to draw moment diagrams and how to get moments. So I, I don't see you all having too big of a problem with the M. Now, the Y and the I, okay, so I is the moment of inertia. So again, for wide flanges, you can just look that up. You can compute it. Um, we'll go through an example here in a little bit on how to compute it. Um, but then Y is your distance from the centroid to the point in question. So if you remember when you bend a beam, there is zero bending stress along the centroid, and then it increases or decreases as you get further away from the centroid. Now, keep that in mind. There's zero bending stress at the centroid, and then the further away you get from the centroid, it increases. So if you plot that, 
it looks something like this. Okay, so here on the top right, if you look right here, this would be sigma equals my over i if I were to graph it. Okay, so zero bending stress at the centroid, and then as my y increases, as I get away from the centroid, I get higher bending stress. So this is my, my bending stress profile, as you were. We, we, we tend to call that a, a bending stress profile. Um, the further away you get from the centroid, the higher your bending stresses. Okay? So it stands to reason that if you're a designer, what you really care about when you're bending a beam is the stress at the very tippy, tippy, tippy top of the beam and way down at the bottom, the lowest point possible. We call that, that tippy, tippy top and that very bottom. I know those are very technical terms. We call those extreme fibers. So if you ever hear me use the term extreme fiber, what I'm saying is the, the, the outermost section of the beam, the furthest away from the centroid. Now, so that's what we care about when we're designing. Now, if you have a beam that is symmetric, about the axis that you're bending. So here, I, if you look over here uh, on this, this image right here, I have a beam and I'm bending it. So that's the centroid. And as you can see, it's symmetric. It's symmetric about the axis of, of which I'm bending it, okay? So if it's symmetric about that axis, um, we have sort of a shortcut that we do, okay? So if we look at this, the maximum bending stress would occur at the top, but it would also occur at the bottom. These would be equal values, just one would be in compression and one would be in tension, but the numbers would be the same. So if I take the moment of inertia and I divide it by this distance D, which is the distance of the, to the extreme fiber, which if it's symmetric, then if, if it's H tall, for example, then half of H and half of H, that'll give you your C distance. We have a shortcut, and we call that term a section modulus. We call it S, okay? So instead of using sigma equals my over i, you can find the maximum bending stress by just taking m over S, okay? And so it's, it's sort of like, you know, with when you have a, a member and you're loading it axially, the stress is P over A. Well, the maximum bending stress is just m over S. So S is just sort of a, a shortcut for us to do that um, when we're looking at maximum stresses. Now, the, again, to keep in mind, section moduli, uh, like you have just one value when it's symmetric about its axis of bending. And so that's going to be a pretty clear distinction. We're going to talk about symmetric sections first, and then later we're going to look at non-symmetric. Um, one of the things that you will see in the manual is if you look at the x-axis and the y-axis, there are different s values. When you see me write this down, sometimes I'll use a subscript. So S, S of X would be if it's being bent about the X axis or bent about the horizontal axis. And so for Y flanges, we would call that the strong axis. And then for the Y axis, we'd say bending about the weak axis. That's, that's the Y axis. Okay. So uh, er, hopefully everybody's with me so far. Again, if there's any questions as I'm going through this, please don't, don't hesitate. What we're talking about here is some pretty critical stuff. So I want to make sure that everybody's comfortable uh, with what we're doing. Okay. Now, so I've got sigma equals my over i, and uh, or I can shortcut that as, as m over s. So again, going back to the previous slide, the maximum bending stress occurs at the very, very top and the very, very bottom. Okay. Now, this idea of using sigma equals my over i, that's fine as long as everything remains elastic. In other words, the, the beam has to behave like a rubber band. You know, you put the load on it. Uh, and it bends, you take the load off, and it snaps back to its original state. That's elastic behavior. And elastic behavior in metals and in steel, for example, uh, elastic behavior holds true until you hit your bending stress of Fy, until you hit the, the yield stress. So if you say that your maximum stress is Fy in, in your stress profile, and you solve for M, just multiply both sides. So Fy is M over S, multiply that over. We get this equation right here, okay? And we call that term the yield moment. So the yield moment is the, the point at which the very, very tippy, tippy top or the very, 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 very bottom of the beam hits Fy, okay? That's the yield moment, all right? Now, a question becomes, is that the largest moment that a beam can withstand or a steel beam can withstand? Now, the answer to that question is no, um, but we're going to see that here in a second, okay? I'm going to sort of show that numerically, all right? Now, um, it's probably been a while for a lot of us since we've done a lot of these calculations, so 
I want to look at a beam and I want to go through the math start to finish. Now, before you start breaking out your pencils and whatnot, I've done all this on the slide. So you don't need to, to write a lot of this down. All the slides are uploaded on Blackboard. I just want everybody to sort of follow along with me. Okay. Now let's take a look at this beam. And what I want to do is I want to compute the yield moment. Okay. So we're going to take FY as 50 KSI. Um, the big thing to note is that the beam is symmetric about its axis of bending. So I have a beam that has a 12, 12 by 1 inch top flange, a 12 by 1 inch bottom flange, and this plate is 24 by 1 inches. So it, if again, imagine if I folded the beam like it was a sheet of paper. Like imagine I printed this off on a sheet of paper and I folded it about this dashed line. It would be symmetric. I get the same thing. So whenever a beam is symmetric, uh, the, the calculations become a, a little bit more straightforward. Now, because the beam is symmetric, I want this box here on the bottom. Because the beam is symmetric, we can I easily identify the location of the centroid. Okay, so the beam is has a total height of 26 inches because the web is 24 inches, and then there's a one inch flange on the top and bottom. So the total height is 26 inches. So these C terms are 13 inches. Okay, all right. So that that's my first point. My second point before I move on is I want to read, read this out. I'm actually going to read it verbatim because I want everybody to be clear on this. Even though the beam is symmetric about its axis of bending, we're going to compute the properties, what I'm going to call the long way. Um, and the reason why is if you can do it the long way for a symmetric section, you can do it the long way for a non-symmetric section, and it doesn't become any more or less challenging. Okay. Now, don't worry. The next slide has a lot going on with it, so I, I understand, but let's just take, take it one step at a time. So... Here's our section properties. Okay, I'm going to walk us through this step by step. We've done this before in, in some of my other classes. So I know everybody in here is familiar with this. Don't worry, I'm not going to make you do it. I just want everybody to have sort of a, at the very least a familiarity with, with these calculations. So in order to compute uh, the moment of inertia, we have to set up the following table that we see right here. So um, the first thing we have to do is we have to compute the centroid. I always, uh, you know, whenever you're computing a centroid, you always have to reference your distances from a common reference. So I usually always set my, my reference datum at the very, very bottom of the section. So, and then we set up the following table. So I've got a uh, shape, I've got three shapes, a top flange, a web, and a bottom flange. Okay, so let's take this one column at a time to make sure we're comfortable with. Let's start off with the areas. Super simple. The area of the top flange, 12 times one. The area of the, uh, the web, 24 times 1. The area of the bottom flange, 12 times 1. So the total area in the section is 48 square inches. Again, that's got to be pretty simple. Now, why? Those are the distances from the datum to the centroid of each shape. So let's actually work backwards. Let's start from the bottom flange. Here's the datum at the very, very bottom. The centroid of the bottom flange is right there where the laser pointer is. So how far is it from the laser pointer to the very bottom of the section? That's half an inch. What about for the web? Well, from the datum, I go one inch and then half of 24, which is 12. So that's 13 inches. For the top flange, I go one inch. I go a total of 24 inches for the web and then half that to 25 or 25 and a half, sorry, 25 and a half. So one plus 24 plus a half inch, 25.5. So that's my Y column. AY, just this times this is 306. This times this is 312. This times this is six. Sum that up, 624. I got to do that because to do the centroid, sum of AY over sum of A, I get Y bar is 13 inches. Again, that's what I meant when I said the long way. Um, you should be able to look at it and just see that the centroid's at 13 inches. Uh, but I wanted to uh, go through this the long way for this because for a non-symmetric section, you're not going to be able to just look at it. You have to do the math. Now, moment of inertias. We need the moment of inertia of each individual shape. And remember, for a rectangle, that's BH cubed over 12. Again, B is the horizontal dimension. H is the vertical dimension. For the top flange and the bottom flange, it's 12 times 1 cubed over 12. That's why these values are so tiny. But for the web, it's 1 times 24 cubed. So that's why for the web, it's a really big value. Um, our D values, we just take the Y minus the centroid. So we get 0 for the web because that's where, I mean, the centroid for the web and the centroid for the whole thing are in the same spot. But again, because it's symmetric. 
And then for the top flange in the web, we get 12 and a half inches. It doesn't really matter which direction we do the, the math because we're going to square this term. We take I plus A D squared. I plus A D squared. And we sum it up and we get an I value. Okay. Um, hopefully everybody's clear on this. I know there's a lot on this slide, but if there's any questions, again, please, I have no problem with, with pausing and, and going through all this. Now, now that we've got a moment of inertia, we then uh, look at our section modulus. Um, our moment of inertia is 4904 inches to the fourth. Therefore, our section modulus we would take I over C, that's our, our definition for the section modulus, and so our extreme fiber distance, that's just H over 2 or 13 inches, and so we get a section modulus of about 30 or 377.2 inches cubed, and then we can take that times Fy to get the yield moment. So Fy times S, so 50 KSI, so 50 KSI times this, um, so this is KSI, this is cubic inches, so that's going to give you inch kips. Uh, and 50 times about 377 gives you that, divide by 12, and we get a yield moment of about 1572 uh, foot kips, okay? So to be clear, let's make sure that we're clear, that is the moment that will, re that will cause yielding at the very, very tippy top and the very, very, very bottom of the section. That's how much moment is required to get yielding at those extreme fibers. But the question we have to ask is, is that the largest moment can a, that this beam can withstand? And the answer is no. The beam can actually handle a good bit more than that. Okay. The reason why is what we've got going on on this slide. And this is the new stuff. This is the stuff that you probably didn't see in Engineering 216. Now, re remember, elastic bending theory holds true until the maximum stress equals Fy. So I'm looking here at these bending profiles. I want to focus here on this one on the left. Okay. This is elastic bending stress, and again, once this very, very tippy, tippy top stress, once that hits Fy and that hits Fy, that's when elastic bending theory goes out the door, once we get past this. Okay, so sigma equals my over i works just fine and dandy until we get to this point. But what happens if I keep bending the section? Like here's my beam, I bend it, I bend it, I bend it, I hit this moment. Does that mean if I put a feather on it that the beam explodes? No, the beam can still keep resisting moment, but, but what happens? Well, again, the yield moment is when the very, very tippy, tippy top of the shape has reached Fy, but that hasn't reached Fy, and that hasn't reached Fy, and that hasn't reached Fy. So what if I keep bending? Well, if I keep bending, what happens is the yielding starts, it starts yielding throughout the beam. Uh, the, the maximum stress in the beam is Fy, but what happens is it just keeps bending. It keeps bending, it keeps bending until I hit what you see over here on the right. So what's on the left is when the very, very tippy, tippy top and the very, very bottom of the beam hit Fy, and we call that the yield moment. But over here on the right, that's when the entire section, the entire cross section is yielded, okay? And if this is called the yield moment, we call this over here the plastic moment. The plastic moment is when the entire beam has yielded, not just the very, very top and the very, very bottom, okay? And so that's what the difference is between the yield moment and the plastic moment. That is the maximum moment that a beam can withstand. Now, the, the good side about yield moments and, and plastic moments, there's actually some really cool, cool observations. It's actually a whole lot easier mathematically to compute MP than it is MY. It's a lot easier, okay? To compute MP, all it is is forces times moment arms. It just goes back to statics. In fact, for those of you that are in concrete design, the computation of MP is much more akin to computing MN, like the, the, the nominal moment capacity. In fact, the, the principles are very, very, very similar. Um, the way that we compute MP analytically is we take the force that's in each plate. So if you have like an I-beam, you take the force that's in each plate, and then you just multiply it by the moment, how far it is from the, from the, 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 the middle of the beam. Now, the force in each plate is just Fy times the area of the plate, and then the moment arm is just however far it is from the middle. So we have here this formula for uh, MP. Now, um, 
we in structural engineering like to make things, we, I know it might seem counterintuitive, but we do try and make things as simple as possible when we can. Um, if you look at this formula, uh, the force in each plate is Fy times the area, and then we have our moment arm. So what we can do is we can actually factor Fy out. We can take this Fy and we can pull it out of the equation. And so if we pull it out of the equation, what are we left with? We're left with the sum of the area of each plate times the distance from the middle, okay? And that term, that, that area times y, that sum of those terms, we have a name for that. We call that the plastic section modulus. Uh, and so that term z in the manual, that's what that is, is the area times y. Let me show you how that works here on this example. So here's our previous beam, and I want to remind everybody what we got from, from the previous values. We got an s value of 377, and we got a yield moment of something like 1571.8. Now to compute z, what we do is we just sum the area times y. Okay. Now let's look over here uh, on this image on the on the uh, on the right. What I did is I I sort of shaded my boxes a little differently. So I've got 12 by one top flange, 12 by one bottom flange, and then uh, this is the half of the web that's above the axis, and this is the half of the web that's below the axis, okay? So if you look here in my, in my formula, I tried to make it as simple as possible. Let's look at the top flange. So the area of the top flange is just 12 by one, which is 12 square inches, and this 12 and a half inches here, what is that? That is the distance from the centroid, or, or this, this, this axis here. How far is it from there to the center of this plate? Well, it's, 12 inches to get to the bottom, and then a half inch to get to the, to the middle. So that's it. For the upper web portion, what's the area of this red box? Well, it's 1 by 12, because that dimension is 12. And then how far is it from the axis to the center? How far is it from the axis to the red dot if it's right there? Well, it's half of 12. It's 6 inches. So... We do the same thing for the lower web portion, the same thing for the bottom flange, and we get a Z of 444. Again, Z is a whole lot easier to compute than S. It's a lot easier. Um, when it's all said and done, if you take FY times Z, you get 22,000 inch kips or 1,850 foot kips. And look, look at what we got above, um, uh, higher. So two observations to make. Fortunately, Z is much easier to compute than S. There's a lot less steps, a lot more grunt work, or a lot less grunt work. It's a lot more straightforward. Um, and also, Z is bigger than S. So, MP is bigger than MY, okay? Um, and so, that that's sort of my, my first point, I guess, of my lecture overall that I want to make is, is the, the straightforwardness of this calc. Um, again, if anybody has any questions, let me know, because uh, I want to make sure that we're addressing them. Now, here's the thing. Everything I've said just now is uh, holds true for a symmetric shape. What if the section is not symmetric? What if it's not symmetric about the middle or about the axis about which, which when it's bending? Okay. To do that, to handle non-symmetric sections, i got to introduce a new term, okay? Uh, this new term, I'm going to call this, uh, or I, I guess I'm introducing two new terms. Uh, I'm going to introduce what's called the elastic neutral axis and what's called the plastic neutral axis. Now, the elastic neutral axis is just a fancy term for what everybody in here should be familiar with, and that's where the centroid is. Okay, um, So everybody in here should know how to compute the centroid. We literally just did this here, that's what we were doing here, sum of A, Y over sum of A. That, that's the centroid. Okay? Now, the elastic neutral axis is where the centroid is. The plastic neutral axis is the axis that splits the section into two equal areas. Okay. Now, it may seem like those would be this, in the same place, but for non-symmetric sections, that, that's not the case. For, symmetric, for sections that, that are symmetric about their axis of bending, they are in the same place. Okay. And sometimes... Just to, to make sure that we're clear on terminology, sometimes we'll use the following terms. Um, S, we sometimes call the elastic section modulus, and Z, we sometimes call that the plastic section modulus, just to uh, indicate that there's a difference between the two. Um, to illustrate what I'm talking about here, I want to look at this beam, and this is the beam that we're going to do together uh, in, uh, in our class. So I want to compute Z 
specifically zx, we'll say it's bending about the horizontal axis. I want to compute z for this beam. Okay. Now, you should be able to tell that it's not symmetric about the horizontal section. I can't draw a line horizontally and that, like imagine if I printed this out on a sheet of paper. I can't draw a line horizontally and then fold that paper to where they would look the same. They're 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 not. It, it's um uh, the the, uh, the the top flange and the bottom flange look differently, so I can't do that. Now, it is symmetric about its vertical axis. I, if I was bending the beam the other way, I could draw a line vertically through the middle of the web and then fold a sheet of paper, and it would look the same. So along the vertical axis, it, it's fine, but along the uh, horizontal axis, that isn't going to work. So I want to compute Zx for this beam, okay? And that's, that's what I want to do together, okay? So... Let me stop sharing this. Okay. Now, here is my section, um, and I want to compute ZX. Okay. And again, once you once you sort of get your head wrapped around how to do this. This is really simple, okay? It's, it's probably one of the simplest things we do in steel design. Now, um, in order to determine ZX, what I've got to do is I've got to figure out the point at which the area above the axis equals the area below the axis. Now, I don't know exactly where that is, but I'm going to take a wild guess and say it's probably like somewhere here, Some, somewhere in this vicinity. Okay, and so we'll call this the plastic neutral axis. Plastic neutral axis. Okay, now again, I don't know where exactly that is. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that this dimension here, we're going to call that X. Okay, um, we'll figure out what X is here in a second, but for now, we'll say that's X. Now, if that's X, that dimension here, this dimension should be 32 minus X because the web is 32 inches tall. So if the bottom segment is X, that makes that 32 minus X. Okay. I'm going to get my calculator and do this one with me. All right. So how do we do this? We say that the area above equals the area Below. It's that simple. So let's take a look at the area above. What is the formula for the area above this line? Well, it's the area of the top flange, which is 14 times three quarters. Which, by the way, I'm I'm gonna um uh, I'm gonna forgo putting the the unit symbols on here since everything is in inches. I'll just keep it simple. All right. Plus now, what's the area of this? Let me let me shade. Let me use my shading here. What is the area of that rectangle? What is the area of it? Well, the rectangle is five eighths of an inch wide, and it's 32 minus x tall. That's got to equal the area below, which we have a flange that's 18 by one and a quarter, one and a quarter, not one and a half, plus five-eighths times x. Again, five-eighths times x, that's just the area of that rectangle. And so if you've got that, just solve for x. So 14 times three quarters, that's 10.5 plus five eighths times 32, that's 20 minus five eighths X equals 18 times 1.25 is 22.5 plus five eighths X. So 10.5 plus 20, that is 30.5 minus 5.8x. 
equals 22.5 plus 5 eighths x. And so subtract that. So that's 8, and then add. Here, I'll do those in a different color. So. So this is minus, oh, minus 22.5, minus 22.5, and that's plus 5 eighths, plus 5 eighths. And so 8 equals, is that 5 fourths x? or x equals 6.4 inches. That should be pretty straightforward. So if we want, we can say 6.4 inches and 32 minus x. Here, I'll move this over. Thirty two minus X is twenty five point six inches. All right. Everybody good with me so far? Again, if you got any questions, just holler. Okay. Now I, I'm just gonna indicate something real quick, uh, and you'll see why here in a second. Um, note from the bottom. PNA is located. Actually, let me rewrite. Let me rewrite this. PNA is located 7.65 inches from the bottom. Okay, that has no bearing whatsoever on the problem we're about to do. But the reason why I'm putting that there is because we're going to use, we're going to look back at our slides here in a second. And when I show you 7.65, I just, I'm, I can hear now, like, why, where did that come from? And all it is is this dimension here is 1.25 inches. So 6.4 plus 1.25. I just want you to see uh, that we're going to see this value here in a second. And so, if you've got that, the plastic section modulus is really easy. I always put a line through my Z's so that I don't get them confused with my twos. Just draw yourself out a little table. And we're going to have, oh, we're going to have um, four uh, shapes that we're going to have to consider. So let me scroll up a little bit. We're going to have a top flange, the upper web, that's the blue rectangle, the lower, uh, the red rectangle, and then the bottom flange. So we'll say top flange, web upper, web lower. And the bottom flange. So let's just take the area of each shape. So the top flange, what is that? The top flange, the area is 14 times 3 quarters, which um, is 10.5. All right. Um, how, uh, let, let's do the areas. Let's just do all these together. The upper web is 25.6 times 5 eighths, which is 16. What about the lower web? 6.4 times 5 eighths is 4. 
and 14 times, or sorry, uh, uh, 18 times 1.25, that is 22.5. So here, let me let me rewrite that to make sure that it looks like it's 6.4, because it looks like 64. And one quick way you can eyeball to make sure you did the math right, what's the top flange plus the upper web? That's, uh, what, 26 and a half? And then the lower web plus the bottom flange is 26 and a half. So you know you did that correctly. And then now we have to determine our Y distances. So our Y distances are distances from the PNA, from the, the, the dashed line, from the, the, the center, if you will, the plastic neutral axis, to the centroid of each shape. So let's take the top flange first. How far is it from the PNA? How far is it from the PNA to the centroid of that shape? So what we're looking for is essentially the distance from that to that. That's what we're looking for. So we'll call this YTF. So it's 25.6 plus half that thickness. So 25.6 plus half of three quarters. So that's 25.975. And then For the upper web, we're talking about that. So web upper. So that's just half of 25.6, which is 12.8. Uh, this one, 6.4, half of that, 3.2. And then the last one, so we got to go 6.4 plus half of 1.25, so that's 7.025. So here, I'll draw those dimensions on here to make sure that we're all clear with that. So I know there's a lot going on in that diagram, but hopefully that should be pretty clear. And so now we just have to compute this out. So it's just row by row. So, so let's see. Give me a second. I'll just write them all. Okay, so I'm getting, let me see, for this one, I'm getting 272.74, 204 204.8, 12.8, 158.06, and so if I sum those up, I get 648.4, so ZX is 648.4 cubic inches. Now, just so everybody's clear, um, if you wanted to compute the plastic moment, that is super simple. All you take is just FY 
times Z. So for this problem, Fy was 50 KSI. Um, Z is 648.4 cubic inches. And then we probably ought to convert that because we're going to get an answer that's in foot kips or in inch kips. And so moments, we typically like those in foot kips. And so that times 50 over 12 is 2701.67 foot kips. I'll give you all a second. I want to see if anybody has any questions. And if I need to scroll up and down, if there's anything you missed, let me know. All right, um, I want to call everybody's attention to one point that I drew up here in the box. The, remember, we got that X was 6.4, and again, if you measure that from the very, very bottom, that comes out to 7.65 inches just because of the flange, an inch and a quarter. If you go back to the, um, to the uh, 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 slideshow, let me go back to the slideshow. Okay, so here's the slideshow. Okay, so here's the problem that we did. I want to go to the next slide because I want to show you something. So look at this. What I did for that beam is I went and I did what we did for the symmetric beam. I just did for the non-symmetric beam. So this is the exact same process. Again, measuring my datum from the bottom and, you know, the top flange, the area, the Y, the AY, the I naught, the D, and so on and so forth. The exact same process. The numbers aren't as pretty because, you know, we've got some decimal values and whatnot. But again, there's no difference whatsoever in the process. But look what we get here. Look what we get for Y bar. Y bar is 13.436 inches, okay, from the bottom. That is the location of the elastic neutral axis. The plastic neutral axis we got was from the bottom 7.65 inches. So they're not in the same place, okay. If I go on to the next slide and uh, I, I've sort of summarized everything here. So in this slide, you should see, so for instance, Y from the PNA, 7.65 inches, ZX is uh, 648.4. Um, that's what we just got in our example. And we got our MP is uh, 2701.7. That's what we just calculated. The elastic behavior, again, it's not in the same spot. Now, the reason why is because as the section gets more and more yielding, what the, the physics of it is, as the section gets more and more yielding, the where the neutral axis is, it has to change in order to ensure that compression equals tension. So that's why the axis moves from one location to another. Now, um, so that, that's why they're in the different, uh, different spots. Now, if you want to compute the yield moment, what you do for the yield moment is you compute because it's not symmetric, there isn't one S value. There's actually two of them. So you compute an S value for the top of the section. So let me go back to the previous slide. The previous slide, remember, our centroid is 13.436 from the bottom. So we have an extreme fiber distance from the uh, for the bottom. We have an extreme fiber distance for the top. Okay. So you actually get two different section moduli. So you get an S for the top and an S for the bottom. And then for your yield moment, you take FY times the minimum. Uh, and and I'll, there, there's a real easy why, uh, reason why you take the minimum, because you're trying to figure out 
which flange is going to yield first. Is the top flange going to yield first or is the bottom flange going to yield first? And the way that you figure that out is you just take Fy times whichever the, of these two values are smaller, in which case it's this one. So again, the yield moment also comes out to be smaller than the plastic moment. The yield moment's like 2020. Uh, the plastic moment's like 2700. So again, the plastic moment is always the largest moment that a section can withstand. So some final observations. So uh, this slide really, I just want to um, I want to make sure that everybody's clear on this. So whenever you're dealing with a section that is symmetric, again, symmetric is if I draw the section on a sheet of paper and I draw a line, I can fold the sheet of paper about that line and I get the same shape. That's what I mean by symmetric. Whenever beams are being bent about their axis of bending and they're symmetric about that axis, the ENA and the PNA are at the same spot. Only one S value is needed, and then MP is always larger than MY, always the case. When you're dealing with beams that are not symmetric, the ENA and the PNA are not in the same spot. They move, uh, and again, they move to for C equals T, and I'll, I'll go into that here in a second. There's, always, there's two S values, uh, and you compute MY as the smaller. And again, the reason why we multiply by the smaller of the two S values is we're trying to figure out which side of the beam yields first. But again, MP is still larger than MY. Now, some other observations. If you remember, like a lot earlier in the semester, I, I told you all when we were looking at certain properties, I said, remember in angles when we were looking at like shear uh, shear lag factors for angles? And I said, you know, whenever you're looking up the properties, you've got this Y bar and you got this YP. And remember how I said, you know, for now, just ignore the YP. I'll explain it later. Now I'm explaining it, okay? The Y bar is the location of the elastic neutral axis. The YP is the location of the plastic neutral axis. So the angles are not symmetric. They're not symmetric about their axis of bending, so they're not in the same spot. So that's what this property is doing. It's listing the Y bar and the YP, okay? So that's why before we never used the YP values because what we needed was the centroid, okay? And whenever it reports an S value, remember, because an angle is not symmetric, there's an S value for, say, the top of the section for the bottom. That's just the smallest of the two. So it's always reporting the smallest. Now, uh, another final observation. This isn't going to affect us at all in this class, but I just kind of wanted to mention it for posterity. Technically, what I said about the PNA was wrong, or I would say wrong, maybe, maybe inaccurate is the best. I said that the plastic neutral axis is where the area above equals the area below. Technically, it's where the force above equals the force below, so where compression equals tension. That doesn't matter if the beam is made of the same steel grade. Like if FY is 50 KSI for the entire beam, then whether you look at uh, compression equals tension or area above equals area below, it's, it's the same thing. However, if the section contains different FY values, uh, then that's not the case, and you just have to look at where the equal forces are. I'm not going to make you all do that. The only reason I mention that is because I'm a bridge engineer, and we sometimes do that in bridges. Uh, sometimes we use a 70 KSI uh, bottom flange, for instance, and maybe a 50 KSI top flange and web. Uh, if you ever see that uh, type of beam, design, we call that a hybrid beam or a hybrid section, uh, and we just do that to try and shave weight off the section, but in buildings, we never do that, so or very, very, very rarely would we ever do that. Uh, so, um, so we don't ever have to worry about that in this class. And don't worry, I'm never going to ask you all a problem like that. I'm just throwing it out there for the future. Um, that's all I have for the slides. Let me pull something up real quick. I know we're running short on time. But um, I want to show you all the homework that we've got coming because, I, I, again, I really wanted to make it uh, as easy on you as possible. Um, uh, give me one second. All right, so here's your homework. I just want you to compute ZX for this. And I gave you some hints, which if you follow these hints, I guarantee you, you could probably do this problem in about two minutes. It's really, really simple. I wanted to give you a short homework assignment because you all have a test in concrete, and so I didn't want to bog you down with a lot of work. I'm sure that that last 
steel design homework was a little bit longer than, than you probably wanted, so I'm, I'm sort of making up for it with this. I just want you to compute ZX for this. You don't need to worry about P, just ZX. Um, uh, and, and if you follow that hint, compute the area of each plate. Uh, so the 10 by 1 and 1 8 and the 15 by 3 quarter. Again, you're going to see this is a really simple problem. Um, that's all I've got, everybody, for today. If, unless there are any questions. Um, uh, uh, unless there are any questions. Um, that's all I have. I will see you all. Uh, on Wednesday, uh, what we're going to do on Wednesday is we're going to start looking at beam design for real. Um, we're going to look at continuously braced uh, beams first, and then we'll look at discreetly braced, but we'll explain all that uh, on Wednesday. For now, if you're good with ZX, then, then you're good to go. Uh, that's all I got, everybody. I'll see you all on Wednesday.